We've been pre-designed since we were kids to believe that if you're comfortable, things are good. I wanna share with you this morning that if you're comfortable somewhere in the business right now, you probably need to take one step just beyond where you're most comfortable. The biggest fish are in the roughest water. If you are going to pursue a life of purpose and influence, which is what leadership is, you've gotta be able to look life in the eyes and go, that is the truth. If you can commit to one incremental shift and believe in that one incremental shift, you're gonna be more successful in the long run. Do you really accept the circumstances you find yourselves in? Are you a person who owns responsibility? Do you create a culture of responsibility? Are you acknowledging the progress that you're making? Or are you so focused on something out there that you can't enjoy what's happening in the moment? When the days are long and the stress is high, don't stop playing. When you wake up in the morning and think, why exactly did I volunteer for this? Don't stop playing. When you were struck with something that you were prepared for but did not expect, don't stop playing. Accept your circumstances, take action, take responsibility, acknowledge progress, commit to great habits of gratitude, and kindle your influence. Mike is a coach to leaders across North America. Our nation's foremost media outlets have invited Mike to share his thoughts on what it takes to lead courageously. Mike was chosen as one of the 40 hottest business speakers in America, and a new book, Leadership Isn't for Cowards, was just released. And Mike has a bachelor's in business and a master's in psychology. So I could go on and on because he's got tons of accolades, but why don't you just take it away, Mike, and show us your stuff. I'm really privileged to be able to spend some time with you now talking about how to take your business up to another level relative to your customer experience. I used to run a psychiatric hospital in California. <laughs> I realize that's redundant. So everybody stand up, please. Look around the room, make eye contact with three and a half people, please. The half person is the short person. All right. Here's what I need for you to do, please. I need for everyone in the room to find somebody in the room that it looks like you can trust, somebody who doesn't work with you. Quickly, everybody gets a partner, no threesomes, go. <laughs> Just 10 seconds or less answering this question. What is the biggest challenge you are currently facing in your job every day? <laughs> Don't you feel better? I mean, if that exercise isn't good for anything else, isn't it good for, oh my God, I thought I had problems. Jeez. <laughs> All right, I need you to find a place to sit so you can sit with your partner. You need to sit beside your partner if possible. Okay, turn and face your partner, please. Raise your right hand. Put your right hand against your partner's right hand. Don't get nervous, germaphobes. Don't get nervous. <laughs> choose an A person and a B person. Between the two of you, choose an A person and a B person. Here comes a psychological test. You ready? A people. A people, push. B people, why are you pushing? <laughs> All right. I said A people, push. B people said, I don't think so, control freak. <laughs> don't think so. The B people said, not so fast, pushing. Now here's the question. B people, why did you push back? It's a natural tendency. I didn't push back. Yeah, sure you didn't, teacher's pet. I was trying to be... <laughs> I was trying to be supportive, whatever. Here's the reason, here's the reason you push back. You push back because you don't like to be pushed. Human beings hate it, have you ever noticed that? But since you were a kid, you were taught, push yourself to get better grades, push yourself to get along better with your brother and sister, push yourself to graduate, push yourself to tie your shoes, push yourself to get potty trained, push yourself, push yourself, push yourself. And if you think about it, it all started with push. You ever thought about that? <laughs> There you were, taking a nice little nap, all cozy, life was good. You hear some muffled person, push! You're like, oh my God, what the? Bam, there you are, bright light. Somebody smacks you on the butt, shoves something up your nose, sucks the snot out, throws you in a crib, and that's how it all started. <laughs> but you know what I know? I know that you and I don't like to be pushed, and neither do your customers. And what we're going to talk about is how the era of push is over, and yet we still believe that's the key to success. And so what we have to figure out is this new notion, this new idea in customer psychology called invitation. How do we invite customers? How do we invite people to join us in a way that's compelling enough for them to feel like being loyal to you is the most important thing? 
the great challenge of creating amazing customer experiences is the extent to which we are able to bridge the gap here. The gap between the experience we intend to create and the experience we actually create. You see, what organizations that are powerfully successful do is they're able to bridge the gap between intent and reality, between what we want to do and what we actually do, between the people that we intend to be when we get up in the morning and the people that we are when we go to bed that night. But intention doesn't appear to be enough because there still exists a gap, even for smart, well-intended people like me and you. So the question I want us to explore this morning is this, why? Why the gap between what we intend to do and what we actually do? Why do you think? Just be brave, little buckaroo. Shout out the reasons you think smart people still have a gap. Let's do my favorite part of any session. I, I, this came about as an accident about 10 years ago. I was speaking at a hospital, and I just did this, what we're about to do, and it's caught on, so we're going to do it here this morning. It's now famously known as an excuse-a-thon. Now, here's what an excuse-a-thon is. Any excuse you've ever heard your friends, family, kids, anyone use, and I'll write them down. Go. Past experience. What else? No resources. You're a little better at this than I expected. Go ahead. <laughs> <What up>? <laughs> Lazy. <coughs> Thanks for that confession, sir. Lazy. Oh, I mean about your friend. I mean about your friend. How many of you in this room have children that you know of? Can I see your hands, please? <laughs> There's some guys in here going, oh, man. Oh. How many of you in this room have certain behavioral expectations of your kids? Let's pretend we all have a five-year-old. I can't make it so. But let's just pretend we do. And we've met a new family in the neighborhood. They have a five-year-old as well. We've invited them to the house tonight for dinner and cocktails. And prior to their arrival at the house, we decide to have an obligatory conversation with our five-year-old. It goes like this. Come here. No, put that, hey, put that stuff down. Come, hey, come here. Listen to me. We're having company over tonight. They have a five-year-old just like you. Well, I don't know if they're just like you, but I know they have a five-year-old. And uh, this kid's new in the neighborhood, doesn't have any friends. And I want you to make them feel welcome because you remember how it was when you didn't have any friends. In fact, I'm kind of surprised you have any friends now. <laughs> so I want you to mind your manners, share your toys, make this kid feel welcome. Do you understand? The child dutifully says what? Which we know is a? And then we say, what I don't understand why we say to kids, we say, now don't make me tell you again. Like somehow the kid is in their room hatching a plot for yet another lecture by their parents. <laughs> we dismiss our child. We go about preparing the home for dinner tonight absolutely certain that our parenting skills are going to manifest themselves in all of their prowess tonight. And then at 6 o'clock that night, right on cue, there's a knock on the door. We go to the front door with our five-year-old in tow. We walk to the front door. We open the front door. We introduce our five-year-old to their five-year-old. And to our horror, our five-year-old has an attitude. We cannot believe it. They sound like a semi-truck stopping. <laughs> you ever notice when you're mad at a kid, you can barely talk? What the, we just had a conversation. Dude, would you, could, what, what happened? Your child looks at you like this. I don't know what you're talking about right now. <laughs> Didn't we have a conversation just a few hours ago about my behavioral expectations? Yes, I seem to recall such a conversation. It was actually more of a lecture. <laughs> Didn't you agree to abide by my expectations? Yes, at the time, your expectations seemed completely reasonable. Then what happened? The kid says what? Yeah. So you look at the kid and you say, I really want an explanation. Your child looks you right in the eyes and says, do you really want an explanation? Or is that simply a rhetorical question? <laughs> no, wise guy, I really want an explanation. So your child looks you right in the eyes and says, you know, I got to tell you, I gave careful consideration to your request for me to be nice to that kid. But after soccer and t-ball and all you got me doing every day, I didn't know how to be nice to that kid. Plus, with my past experiences, I didn't think I really had the resources to do it. Plus, the kid's kind of a brat. I thought it was his fault. And with all the other priorities I have, I didn't really think I could do it. But then it occurred to me, the real problem in this family is a compensation problem. You know. <laughs> I'm only getting about 50 cents a week from you right now. If you'd crank it up a little bit, you could get more than a grin out of me. But right now, a grin's all 50 cents is really worth. But I would even be willing to do that. I would be willing to stretch myself, Mom, if we could solve the staffing problems. You know, I'm an only child. And 
I'm carrying nice all by myself. If you and daddy get busy and knock out a couple more kids, we can spread nice amongst all of us. But right now I'm carrying it all by myself and I don't think it's my job. Plus, since when does a five-year-old have the equipment and technology to be nice to another kid? I've told you we've got staffing problems and I can't follow through anyway at my age. Plus, I'm so tired of you and dad talking about politics all the time. I just decided to be lazy. And speaking of you and dad, after watching you two get along, I don't really know how to get along with another person. <laughs> Plus, I think that kid's crazy anyway, and I didn't believe you at the time, and I just kind of became forgetful because all the interruptions. Plus, did you meet that kid? He has a fascination with military equipment. He scares me. <laughs> oh. My guess is none of you in this room would allow your child to get away with one single excuse on this flip chart. And yet I'll guarantee you every one of us in this room have used something on that flip chart, including me, in the last 60 to 90 days to justify why we have not more effectively closed the gap between intention and actual execution. You see, the real thing about customer experiences is this. Customers want the experience to blend and connect without all of this in the way. I am not saying that you don't have real obstacles and real challenges in your business. It is not the absence of these. It is not standing in front of the mirror and giving yourself some hokey self-help talk like every day in every way I'm getting better and better. <laughs> no, you're not. You're dying every day. So <laughs> it is about saying I accept it, but I deny the power. Let me say it again. What we know about high performers is they accept the presence of the challenges they face and deny the power of it to define them. And Dr. Seligman at the University of Pennsylvania did some research for people who are optimists and pessimists. And he wanted to figure out if optimists have more bad, or fewer bad things happen to them than pessimists. Do pessimists just naturally have more bad things happen in their life and thus it creates them, makes them more pessimistic? What do you think he found out? It's exactly the same. Over a lifetime, pessimists and optimists generally have the same percentage of good things and bad things that happen to them. The difference is not if, that we pretend. See, in the field of psychology, if you pretend these don't exist in your life, we call that crazy. If, <laughs> if, on the other hand, you accept that these are present, but you do not allow them to define you, you find yourself more successful. And that's what leadership is. Leadership has nothing to do with your rank. Leadership has nothing to do with your position. Leader has, leadership has nothing to do with how smart you are, how much money you make. What leadership has to do with is the extent to which you can persevere under significant and challenging experiences. Let me share with you how to do that. The first thing I'd like you to think about is this. The one measure I use for all people I've worked with when I was a practicing clinician and now when I speak or when I work with groups around the world is this. Are your yeses and nos really clear? Do you know what your yeses are in your life and what your nos are? Are you saying yes to the things that make you better, make you feel better, encourage you, empower you, make you stronger, more connected, more grounded, living your life more on purpose? Are you saying no to things that drain you, suck the life out of you, or are not in alignment with your core values? If you are going to pursue a life of purpose and influence, which is what leadership is, you've got to be able to look life in the eyes and go, that is the truth, and not judge it. It's not good, it's not bad, it's not right, it's not wrong. The second thing, is it take action or take responsibility? What does it say there? You notice we live in a world of people who don't want to take responsibility. Look at, a, look at a Starbucks coffee cup. On the bottom of the cup, you know what it says? Caution, the beverage you're about to enjoy is extremely hot. Is this helpful to you? Wouldn't it be more helpful if it said, caution, you just paid $5 for a cup of coffee. <laughs> this could lead to further irrational retail purchases. That would be a problem. In your life, you're going to create a culture of blame or a culture of responsibility. A culture of responsibility seeks to repair. Repairs relationships, repairs who you are, repairs connection. That's repair. But you can't repair it until you own it. Blame seeks to punish. People that blame say, I am here to punish me or you. One of us has got to be punished. And the person that's going to be punished is the person whose fault it is. I'd rather live in a world and work for a company and be a person who's all about personal responsibility. I own what's mine and I'm going to repair it. And don't forget, it's all about the bacon. Have a great conference. Be back here for Scott's big announcement. Thanks, everybody. Most people get discouraged about one inch from the finish line or one second from being complete. Most of the time, we don't push through that last little barrier. But that moment is the moment to push.